women in the Civil War changes uh, several times throughout the war. Uh, when one in the 20th or 21st century says nurse, you automatically think of a woman. But in the 19th century, at the beginning of the Civil War, when you said nurse, it indicated a male nurse. In keeping with the Victorian times, one must, must remember that propriety of that era determined that a woman should not see the body of a man that was not her husband or her child. Thus, it would make it not at all suitable or proper for a woman to tend to a wounded soldier. So early in the war, most nurses were men. Elizabeth Edmonds answered the door to find a stranger named Frank Thompson. Elizabeth invited the gentleman in for dinner. The grateful man listened as Mrs. Edmonds told him about her missing daughter, Sarah. After listening to the heartbroken woman's story, Frank could take no more. Mother, dear, Mr. Thompson said, don't you know me? Sarah Edmonds, in order to escape an arranged marriage and to move freely in a man's world, had changed her appearance to the extent that even her own mother did not recognize her. Not long after her visit home, with only five dollars to her name, Sarah hiked to Hartford, Connecticut, approximately 450 miles. Desolate, she reached Hartford with no money and no friends. My feet were badly frostbitten, and my boots literally worn out, and my last suit of clothes rather the worse for wear, and my linen. Well, it is hardly worth speaking of. But I had a good watch and chain, which I pawned for a sum sufficient to enable me to make a more respectable appearance. She managed to get a job selling books at Hurlbert and Company. She moved to Michigan shortly before the Civil War broke out. When it did, she became a member of the Flint Union Greys, a part of the Second Michigan. The Second Michigan had its first encounter at the Battle of Bull Run. Sarah was on hospital duty, caring for the stream of wounded soldiers. She did not realize at first that the Union Army had retreated in panic, and she was forced to flee on foot. Cavalry, but not near enough to discover me as the night was exceedingly dark, and the rain came down in torrents. The only way out was to climb a fence and go across lots, which I immediately did. By the spring of 1862, the Army of the Potomac was ready to march on Richmond and put an end to the conflict. With an extensive spy network inside Richmond, the Union Army was well informed about the Confederate movements and was making headway up the peninsula. On April 28th, Timothy Webster, the United States' best secret agent, was captured and hanged in the Confederate capital. They needed a replacement quickly to ascertain the forces before them at Yorktown. Sarah was recommended for the position by a friend. Her first mission was to penetrate the lines of Yorktown and determine the ordinance and layout of defenses. Taking on a disguise within a disguise, Sarah had her head shaved, acquired a wig and typical clothing of a slave, then painted herself a deep brown. Sarah fell in with the other slaves, taking coffee and food to the soldiers, where she gained the knowledge she needed. Concealing the information in her shoe, Sarah looked for a way to escape. While waiting for her opportunity, she managed to catch a glimpse of the soon-to-be commander, Robert E. Lee. The following night, opportunity came when a black picket was killed by enemy fire. She was pressed into service in his place. After ascertaining as well as possible the position of the picket on each side of me, I deliberately and noiselessly stepped into the darkness. Night the faithful but depart, why is their memory sacred to the heart? Mail carriers on both sides were often the targets of sharpshooters. Riding across hundreds of miles, they carried documents that were important to the enemy. Sarah, now a mail carrier herself, ran across a friend from home, Lieutenant James V. He was tall, had black wavy hair, and large black eyes. He was a sincere Christian, active in all the duties devolving upon a Christian soldier, and was greatly beloved by both officers and men. Back in Canada, they had been intimate, Sarah's first romance. When we met in the army, we met as strangers. We became acquainted again, and a new friendship sprang up on his part, for mine was not new, which was very pleasant, at least to me. At times my position became very embarrassing, for I was obliged to listen to a recapitulation of my own former conversations. One day she returned with the mail, having heard the eerie sounds of mail rustling under her horse's hooves. I found the camp almost deserted, 
and an unusual silence pervading all around. I saw a procession of soldiers slowly winding their way from a peach orchard where they had just deposited the remains of Comrade. I did not dare go and meet them to inquire, but I waited in painful suspense until the procession came up, with arms reversed. I stepped forward and inquired whom they had buried. Lieutenant James V. was the reply. I went to my tent without uttering a word. I felt as if it could not be possible what I heard was true. It must be someone else. I did not inquire how, when, or where he had been killed, but there I sat with tearless eyes. They made his grave under a beautiful pear tree in full bloom, where he sleeps peacefully, notwithstanding the roar of cannon and the din of battle, which peal forth their funeral notes over his dreamless bed. Twelve o'clock came, but I could not sleep. I rose up quietly and passed out into the open air. I passed the camp guard, and was soon beside the grave of Lieutenant V. It was there, in that midnight hour, kneeling beside his grave of him who was very dear to me, that I vowed to avenge the death of that Christian hero. I could not forgive his murderers. I did not enjoy taking care of the sick and wounded as I once did, but I longed to go forth and do, as the noble chaplain did as he sent a messenger of death to the rebels. May God have mercy upon your miserable souls.